Books. Again, my name is Marika van der Steenhoven. I'm a friend of Literal Books. I'm also a special collections librarian. I also had the distinct honor of interviewing Kate Hagopian Berry for her book, Mast Year. Um, how, I'm trying to even think of when that was. I know it was a, we spent a morning into afternoon drinking coffee and eating cookies and talking about poetry and life and inspiration. And it was just a landmark uh, moment for me. So um, that's what we're doing here this evening is we're celebrating the work um, of Catherine Hagopian Berry, her poetry that has been published. It was the six publications of literal books. It's a gorgeous book. Here it is, the cover of it. My Zoom screen is not doing it justice, but here it is. Um, and our plan for this evening is to hear Kate read some poetry, to um, have a conversation, talk about inspiration, talk about the book, talk about where, where and what she's doing now. Um, so we'll be doing a poetry reading. Um, then we'll be doing an interactive um, component. Uh, depending on who you talk to, uh, we're, it, it's either called a kento, a cento, or a cento, um, which is essentially we're all going to be working together to create a poem. So there's more information about that coming later, um, but just keep that in the back of your mind. So again, this evening um, is uh, the, the series Literally Alive is dedicated right to the, the writers of the canon of literal books. So I know there are many familiar faces in the audience, but for those of you who perhaps are not familiar with literal books, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background. Um, literal Books is an independent press based in Portland, Maine, um, and it's committed to publishing beautiful books in a variety of genres by writers and artists from Maine and New England. Literal Books was founded in 1975 by members of the Portland Women's Group for the express purpose of publishing the work of women writers. Um, and Literal Books was also one of the founding presses of the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance. The press went into hibernation in 1976, but 42 years later, in 2018, it renewed publication with Agnes Bouchelle's novel, The House on Perry Street. This evening, as I've mentioned several times, we're celebrating Literal Books' sixth book, which is Mast Year. Um, and um, in terms of new books to look out for from Literal Books, I happen to have a copy here of uh, Kate Kennedy's memoir, Skin. It is a gorgeous book and I've just dabbled into it and I'm, I am, I've actually just blocked off a whole section of my weekend to just dive into the text. So I am so excited to explore this, but this is the latest and forthcoming um, book from Literal Books, Skin by Kate Kennedy. We'll be doing an event with her in the future, so stay tuned. Um, to keep up to date and to stay tuned about forthcoming Literally Alive programs, um, you'll want to visit uh, Literal Books website and be sure to sign up for the mailing list. I'm gonna pop that right now into the chat. Look at this. I say I'm not a technologist. Um, okay, but on to tonight's pro program. I gave you a rough overview, um, a quick overview of the proceedings, um, but also here are some housekeeping notes. So again, our program, um, we're slated to run about an hour. Um, I'm gonna wrap up my talkity talk spiel in just a moment and pass things over to Kate, um, who will be reading some poetry. Um, we'll also engage in some conversation in the midst of that. Uh, then we'll be moving on to the Kento Cento Cento portion. Again, more information forthcoming about that, but essentially it's from the Latin for patchwork, um, right? So it's a collage poem um, and it's a po poetic form composed entirely of lines from poets by other poems. Sorry. I'm so excited I just got ahead of myself. <laughs> it's a poetic form composed entirely of lines from poems by other poets. So with this in mind, um, perhaps think of one of your own poems or grab a book of poetry from your shelf and we'll just be asking you to contribute one line. So that's forthcoming, something to keep in your mind um, to kind of percolate on as we engage with Kate. Um, after that, after we compile all of that, we'll move on to some questions and answers. And then once the formal program has ended, we will move into the sort of uh, informal wine and cheese section. Unfortunately, it is BYO wine and cheese, but we'll have a sort of informal hangout afterwards to just chat more. 
So that's the outline for the program this evening. Um, in terms of housekeeping, what we're going to do um, until we kind of jump back into the interactive Cento Kento Cento uh, section is we're actually going to ask all of you to turn off your videos um, as well as mute yourself, which just helps us create a kind of more fluid uh, stream. Um, it takes up less bandwidth and, and we're able to um, to kind of come to you more uh, without any interruptions or noise distractions. So I'll just give you a moment to mute and to, <laughs> to um, uh, shut your video off, which is in the bottom, bottom um, toolbar. Um, but please do continue to interact. So the reaction buttons that are in that toolbar where you probably just muted yourself, uh, let's see if I can get them up here. We've got thumbs up as well as a clap. So you feel free to engage with those reaction features throughout the evening. Um, we have also have the chat on. So if you'd like to, and some of you have done that, we're seeing people from San Francisco Bay, uh, North Carolina. So people from all over the country are joining us. You please feel free to engage with the chat, to offer words to Kate, to chat with each other. Um, but you also don't have to engage. So you're able to turn the chat or to remove the chat from your view by most simply opening to full screen mode or just clicking the chat icon in the bottom toolbar. So those are two ways. If you, if you find the chat distraction, you do not need to engage. But if you liked that sense of community while we're going, please feel free to do that. There will also be a point when we ask you to turn that back on to get the instructions for our interactive component. La la la, okay. I think that that is the housekeeping notes. One thing I do want to mention, since so much of the MAST year, and I want to get in and talk a little bit to, um, with Kate about MAST year and where this title came from, but even just looking at the cover, right, we can get a sense that we're grounded in, in place and in nature. And as I sit here in my dining room in South Portland, I do want to recognize and honor the current tribes who comprise the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Maliseet, and the Mi'kmaq peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I respect the traditional values of these tribes and acknowledge their inherent sovereignty in this territory. For more information about advocacy and the Wabanaki Confederacy, I invite you to visit the main Wabanaki Reaches organizations site, um, for which I've included right now in the chat. But if you're joining us from somewhere that isn't Maine, um, there are lots of fabulous resources um, if you look up via the Google land acknowledgments to find out more information about the indigenous um, people of the area that you now occupy. So. Now, without further ado, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Catherine Hagopian Berry. Kate lives and writes in Bridgeton, Maine. Um, she has appeared in the Cafe Review, Deep Water, A Dangerous New World, Maine Voices on the Climate Crisis, Balancing Act Two, an anthology of poetry by 50 Maine women, and Glass, Poets Resist, among other places. And she's also been a finalist and showcase performer at the Bell Pass Poetry Festival. Before I officially um, turn things over to Kate and uh, unmute her, so she actually has a has a voice in this thing. I wanted to. I was just revisiting my my um, copy of Mast Year, which you can find and purchase on literalbooks.com. Um, I was just looking at the the quotes on the back, and I was particularly drawn to Gary Lawless's quote, which I think uh, just is such a beautiful beautiful summary of Kate's work. This poetry where we look into the hearts of, this is poetry where we look into the hearts of others, find whole worlds there, learn and move on, changed in, in, into, <laughs> into a somehow newer world. I did not do Gary's words justice just then. I learned something about being human from every one of these poems. Oh, and it's true. That is exactly how I felt, and I've expressed this to Kate before. So you are all in for such a treat this evening. And without further ado, Kate, hello. Hello. How are you? I'm pretty amazing. Good. I love, um, we spoke on the phone yesterday, and you said that you were building a, building a set list. But one of the things that I loved about that conversation, and it came up right this evening as participants were joining us was you say you always create a set list of which poems you're going to feature and read, but that that totally changes based on who's in the space. And I heard you saying that when people were jumping in, that things were already changing. So tell me a bit about how you make those decisions and then what poetry do you, what poem do you want to start us off with? 
Um, what goes into putting together a reading? I mean, for me, a lot of it is where the room is, who's in the room, right? Um, the energy of the reading, the story that you want to tell. I think we're really blessed tonight. We have a small enough audience that if you want to turn your video on, I'd love to see your faces. I just saw so that. So I just got care. the thumbs My up from apology. Robert that we can do that on the production end. Um, right. So I am taking that as such a blessing. So don't feel like you have to if you'd like to eat a sandwich. But if you would like to... Show me your yeah, smile as back. I show you mine. That would fill my heart. Um, because it's all about, it's all about the humanity of what we create when we're together. Um, and the longer I participate in communities of poetry, which are such a gift, the more I realize that these communities are so deep and have so many different points of connection, which is why I wanted to start tonight with the poem that started it all for me, the poem that moved from my first publication, which was Balancing Act Two, into my book and begins my book. And once I do that, then I'll, I'll take you in a few different places. But I'd like to begin with Inheritance, which is a poem that um, speaks to me about all the different places that voices can go, powerful voices can go, and um, all of the different places that they come from. So inheritance. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. Stop. Listen. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. She lived under a mountain dappled with bones. She named her daughters for stars. Listen. On the back of morning blinding, they rolled away the rock, and she spoke. She spoke. I would pull skin back lovingly over those bones. If she would speak to me, I would come to her across the pines and cedars, follow the path of every pendant star. I would brush each white hair, pin her scarf close. I would become this inheritance. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. Stop. Listen. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. Her village is lost under the ocean, under the mountains. We have forgotten the way across the pines and cedars. We have forgotten the shape of her hands. We have only this. She was the wise woman. Listen, we know this. She was. She was. Enter Providence of the sewing machines, and my grandmother had already found her secret of letting out and taking in. Like an old blouse, languages faded, and then the dreams. Beans and red sauce swimming like fingers taken by Turks. That school she would have opened to such intensity of sky. Instead, the Alexander left Istanbul, 300 male order brides. And all the way to Marseille, she never once looked back until she caught herself speaking French, and a fresh voice answered. There was only that one October night, field green behind the hospital. She didn't need a photograph. Every curve of her lip remembered how she lay on her back and counted every single star, how she noticed, finally, they shone. I teach my mother how to read fortunes. On a silk scarf I stole from her, the color of bone and new mown grass, blood and autumn sky. She used to wear it with a red gypsy skirt, pretend to read our palms in the Halloween dark. Now, the question of what moves me, holding my bitten nails over the future, smiling my aunt's smile. I want to say, these secrets were meant to be intimate, heard in your voice, the smell of earth turning, hay bales propped like unsteady children in the fields. I want to say, this is how it should go, petaled like a star, thinking she should have known these things. She should remember. She should be teaching me. And I, so that's inheritance. Yay. <laughs> I'm Catherine Hagopian Berry. Uh, she, her, hers, because I was born retrograde and too old to come up with something cooler. Um, I wanted to thank Literal Books, especially because I can't even imagine um, the doors that have opened for me the privilege that I have in being here. Um, I want to thank my family, my long-suffering husband, Chris, 
my children, Adam and Sophia, both of my moms, my mom and my mom-in-law who are here tonight, both of my dads and both of my sisters. Thank you. Um, and so when I planned this set, I wanted to go from this very early poem, really, the poem that kind of got everything started for me, a poem of beginnings, to the kind of crazy things that happens when you write poetry, right? So I had performed this poem, Inheritance, uh, which honors both of my grandmothers and great-grandmothers and great-great-grandmothers. The wise woman story comes from the Jewish side of my family. Um, my great-grandmother on the mail order bride boat is from the Armenian side of the family. And when I did a reading with Gary Lawless, he ended up, um, some of his friends who were Armenian watched the reading. And what they ended up doing was sending me in the mail, if you can follow this, a book written by his friend's father, who was the premier Armenian linguist in English in America during his lifetime. And she was like, I thought you should have this, right? So I start reading a linguistic study of Armenian. And believe me, if I know like zero words of Yiddish, I know zero minus zero words of Armenian, right? But what was fascinating about this is Gary is telling me the story by sending me a note written on a note card, which is from the Villa of the Mysteries at Herculaneum, the Bosque Coreal. And I had studied those frescoes in graduate school. Um, and so I was struck by this crazy coincidence between this book on a language that I should know and knew nothing of. Although this poem does feature two words of Armenian, der, that means father, and meyer, which means mother, and a world that I knew a lot about from school. Um, and then Gary also shared with me on the note card the quote that kind of formed the whole body of this poem, which was a Lord Byron quote that Adam and Eve must have spoken Armenian. So I wanted to take you from one of my very earliest poems to something really I just wrote because a poem arrived for me in the mail and I dedicated it to Gary and sent it to him because it was just such a beautiful story of how poems can open doors, right? So here is Adam in Armenian. Adam and Eve must have spoken Armenian, said Lord Byron. At the source of all the rivers, Adam spoke Armenian. Fire-tongued phoenix, Dur, the father, flame-born, rising ruby red, singing rubiots, a villa door painted on a postcard. You send me with this book, my language I cannot even speak or read. Yet, I know how the door opens. Patterns of initiation, knock knee, child naked, moonless nights, an ancient history. We forsake these whips of grain, ears of corn, back turned veils, civil eyes still lumen, words some laughing god mounted on your spine, along the road of all your bones, a snowbird alphabet tracked in vision, language pilgrim, refugee, exile. The book on the desk in the quiet room, like a lamb ready to eat from your stilled hand. The only word I know is Maya, Mater, Martyr. The faint rose scent ghosting cedar cabinets, afternoon thunder, a black shawl, plate I eat from, mouthing, lost sounds, sacred root words, a holy meal. So I wanted to give you one more new one before I turned to an old one, older one, a nastier one. <laughs> and it's a special new one. If you read the interview with Marika in the back of the book, she asked me how I came up with certain poems and how poems arrived. And that's part of what drew me to share that new poem with you because it literally arrived for me in the mail. Um, and this is a poem that arrived as last year was becoming a book. Um, one of the most amazing things about my book is the artwork in the book from Judy, Judy Allen Esperatu, uh, Judith Allen Esperatu, who's an amazing Portland artist. She spends part of her life when the world is not insane on Greece, 
And she graciously invited Lori Haley, the book designer, Agnes Bouchelle, my amazing editor and publisher, and myself into her studio to look at art, which in one of those like cosmic things took about a second because when we saw the art that ended up in the book, everybody was just like, oh, which left us enough time for Judy to be like, let's go back to the kitchen and share some paklava. Um, and I mean, my family inhales baklava, like it's nobody's business, but that's like kind of industrial paklava. And like, I hadn't had real homemade paklava since my great grandmother had died, you know, and you know, like it's a non-negotiable, you know, when that stuff is homemade and Judy like pops it out of a cookie tin and like starts feeding us baklava. And I'm like, there's gotta be a poem in here somewhere. And for me, the poem happened when I did some research at home on what on, where on earth baklava comes from. And one of the theories is that it comes from an ancient Roman dessert, which had much the same composition, but was known as placenta. And with that, uh, you know, all of these threads of kind of women and mothering and history came together. And especially because Agnes and Laurie are here tonight, I wanted to read you this poem called Placenta. Kitchen window lies in shadow from condos looming, obnoxious millionaires across the street, 19 maple trees on the sidewalk forfeit, their legacy in the color of the brick wall behind the gas stove. Steam from coffee thickening on the burner in the small brass pot, bricky, like my great grandmother's, attic orphaned, longing for sugar, metrios, we all say together, even though this is not quite the language I remember from my childhood speaking. The counter is the same though, broad and flat to roll sheets of phyllo, cutting down an unused paintbrush to spread butter, honey, memory of my great grandmother's arms like waves as they cross the dough, glazed, folded, the green nuts waiting. Baklava is easy when made together. Mother and daughter at the counter, aging, diamond subtle, still on our tongues, sweet names linger the ones we have lost. Me? <laughs> I just unmuted myself like four, 14 times. I was like, she didn't know I was breaking there, right? Sorry, Marika. That's all good. I also think a long pause to allow us to sort of ingest those beautiful words. Um, thank you. Uh, I love the theme of this evening. Uh, that I'm, I'm hearing and seeing emerging being and, and looking at those who, the majority of our audience this evening and thinking about women's stories and women's voices and, and what Stephanie had said at the beginning, you know, she had come into this from, from another sort of women-centric women's work program. So it's just fabulous. And I, I love the baklava placenta women gathering around a table story I put into the chat. Yes, because <laughs> that's just so... Fabulous. So, yeah, what's next on our set list, and yeah. what what can we talk about? So, you you're sharing some new poetry mixed with what you're calling old poetry, even though it's the it's the fresh work here. It's the fresh work, right? Think, so, you've clearly been busy writing. I've been so busy, but that's sort of where I wanted to go next. I love you because you always give me the perfect segue, right? You know, um, it's sort of the magic of last year. And that was how I planned my next little piece was I wanted to talk about why this book is so special and so unique and so powerful to me, um, how it kind of fulfilled a dream I didn't even know I was dreaming when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And I think the easiest way to do that is by starting with a poem and then telling you why I picked it. And I wanted to start with this poem called Frosty. 
receive. Which was on its face, an amazingly simple poem. I was driving home on a spring morning, and if you've ever been in Maine in the early spring, you will know frost heaves. They occur, they're a unfortunate local natural phenomenon that occurs because the melting snow melt gets under the highway and then in the inevitable refreeze, freezes back up, swells back up, expands, cracks the highway, and then in the inevitable remelt, craters back down and sort of, so it creates these giant swells and then these giant absences. And, um, you know, they disrupt your travel. So it's a poem of disruption from the spring of 2019. So I'll share it and then I'll let that lead us down a few more places. Frost heave. Below the highway there is water, frozen tumor convex like a lens. Blink. And it has collapsed back on itself, a trench rigid enough to swallow bear or deer wandering, drunk on early warmth. They have cleared the carcass away leaving only a wide river stain of blood. From a distance speeding, it looks like a mountain, something to catch fire, speak a revelation, tell us why things stay broken, shove with their cold shoulders until the smooth guardrails of our futures crack, force us to change lanes. So one of the things that happens when you write a book, as I've learned, is, you know, you write a book. And this book came to me in such an unexpected way. I mean, I had had a book manuscript for years and years. And when Agnes asked for it, it sort of felt like pixie dust and sparkles and every like kind of ridiculous um, drugstore counter movie fantasy come true. And as I prepared the manuscript for her, I quickly realized the manuscript was changing right under my nose. Um, I was writing poem after new poem after new poem after new poem. The poems that remained in the manuscript from the one that I had had were poems that I was reading aggressively or revising aggressively or encountering in sort of magical and um, unexpected ways, right? But by and large, Mass Year ended up being a record of 2018 through 2019, through the fall of 2019. And I didn't realize that at the time that in 2020 our world would change, right? But I ended up with a really interesting and powerful tension, I think, between how these poems read then and how they read now. And now what I found myself doing is returning to some of the same themes in different ways, which is part of why I constructed the reading the way I did, you know, doors that opened in this book are doors that I found myself walking through in different ways or seeing again in different ways. And part of what I prepared stages some of those contrasts for you. We'll see how much time we have and how many of them I can share. But what I wanted to do next was skip to another poem from last year that again, I feel does that interesting work, right? It's an interesting, it was an interesting poem when I wrote it um, for a certain amount of reasons. Well, that's poorly said <laughs> for, um, for reasons of, it's a poem that I wrote about a childhood memory. Um, my parents, when I was younger, had a printing business and they kept a printing press and they kept it in our garage. And so I have these really formative memories of being 13, 14 years old, watching print runs roll off of an old offset press. And it's a fantastic process if you've never witnessed it. You know, it, it works on laser plates and you have to ink the plates and you have to put the paper through the press and, you know, it's automated, but it's almost like a crank through, like it jams all the time and the ink is uneven you know sometimes you'll over ink the rollers and sometimes you'll under ink the rollers and so there's a lot of like wasted paper as part of the process which meant that my sister and I spent a lot of our early adolescence feeling all of these fantastic papers and paper samples and papers that were over inked and papers that were under inked um, and imagining writing our own poetry on them which was the story that I wanted to tell in the poem, right? But I think it also becomes a different poem in 2020, um, now that we're in sort of a blank season, a season of waiting. So the poem is called Offset. And when you look at it on the page, it actually, I don't know if you can see, but it actually is offset 
in time as well as on the page. Offset. After school, I fell in love with paper. Office bound, my sister and I, our favorite game to study weight, weave, fiber, the boundary between beige and bone, cream, wheat, ecru, hints of color treasure. I favored recycled grays, loved how the ghosts of old boxes would resurrect to touch. We wrote our best poems, remnants. Unsteady cursive, kerning for precision, permanent solid like a lasered plate. The offset press rocking with such force, ink would spill over rollers, flood pages with wild reefs of color, falling from the register like wings drying on the concrete, trembling a fragile backward sound. Cool gray boots, process blue shadows. My son and I on the winter trail, snow heavy in the wet air, he asks me, where the black raspberry, blueberry, where the bright-faced marigold, birdhouse swinging empty on a leaning hemlock tree? I tell him, all things wait for summer. Blank pages of snowy fields, glossy, color ready, longing for watermark, pressure, signature heat. I love that poem so much. I spend I spend so much of my own personal like personal days and also work days thinking about and trying to impress upon undergraduates the importance and the power of of printing and paper and that poem just encapsulates it beautifully. Well, and I wanted to um I wanted to uh go from there to, uh, again, one more poem from last year, and then a final new poem, both of which kind of show this evolution of, of poems that made sense in 2019, but also make a different kind of sense in 2020. I think that's kind of the magic of a mask year is that it allows you to look both forward and backward in time, right? It's a little paradoxical in a delicious way. Um, so what I wanted to do is share with you a poem from last March is a really interesting contrast to this March. Uh, my family began to explore backyard maple sugaring, which is kind of peak Maine. Uh, but it also coincided with a reading of one of Agnes's absolutely brilliant books, The House on Perry Street. And she has one of her characters speak about a term out of Sappho, who uses the word gl glucopicron, which isn't bittersweet. It's sweet, bitter, right? Um, so it's kind of a different pathway into thinking about the contrast between good things and more difficult things. And so this is a poem from March 2019. And then I wanted to end this little piece with a poem that I had written during the pandemic from March 2020, also about sugaring. So this first one is from 2019 and last year called Glucopicron, Sweet, Bitter. We crawl across the dormant field to tap our scrawny maples, log, branch, glove, bonded by deep freeze. We make heat electric, orange cords arterial, sawdust scattering its barren seed over clouded ice. I am too heavy to balance on thin crusts for long. So we leave it to our children who report each hesitant drop, wait patiently for hope to flood taps, shower the sap hungry earth. There is sugar enough to test our faith in loss. Black cauldron pan I bought years ago to heat my feast for one. The old spell was to bury your worst fears alive. That steam bleeding down the kitchen window has wedged a hole in things irreversible. That this time it will not become easier to breathe. That my body won't turn to your body in the small bed. Instead, we tally production golden in mason jars, two, four, six, 19, 20. How much enough for next winter? How much enough for the end of the world? And then from 2020, sugaring, which I wrote on March 14th. My daughter, as the tap goes in, fingers eager, fragile, the first drop, xylem, sweet flow, sap rising, can I? She asked me. Taste, I say. Taste. 
Maple has milked our lost summer. Tate, let her nurse you back to when we ran free at the lake shore and you never wondered how much food our cabinets could hold. That night, my son grabs both my hands, arm woven. They tell us mothering, we will never know endings. Last time to turn back blankets, heal the broken band-aid shallow cuts, place the tooth under the pillow, mark eight weeks on the calendar. My daughter tells me she feels safe in our sugar bush. Sap, still a mystery. Where color happens, how flavor arrives. Subtle, heavy, toffee bright. Heat, the long boil, freeze, thaw, above all, time. Mm -mm. Yeah, I, I, it's been really amazing, you know, thinking back to, to March 2020, let alone March 2019. <laughs> and how all the world has changed and yet nature just continues continues on you know the march <laughs> so i'm cognizant of time and that we have an interactive component here perhaps do you have another set that you wanted to share or what are your feelings right yeah, I have tons oh my gosh it went so fast so yeah i can skip isn't that funny? It just went so much faster than I thought it would. Well, yeah, I mean, even what is what is time right now? I mean, we're all experiencing some sort of out of whatever time is. But yeah, I mean, it's, oh, well, we'll just have to do this again. And oh, we'll no, I can only do a few more. Well, then many more from last year, if I can only read a few more. OK, let me take you through. A few moves. Um, the first is because I began as a poet and ended as a poet um, with my experience at Duke and I have a colleague in poetry watching tonight and so I can't not read this poem for her. Um, our Durham, North Carolina memory, please don't tell anyone, is actually pretty profoundly linked to Chapel Hill. We used to gather in the Silk Road Tea House, which is long gone, but very much resembles Dobra Tea, um, where you sit on the floor and you drink herbal tea out of pots and it's filled with geodes and oriental rugs. And we used to read tarot cards to each other at these low flat tables and spend all night talking. And so, um, I'll start there with a poem about that, and then I will take you through. Oh my goodness. Well, let's start there. <laughs> Yearbook. I am guilty of watching light too long. Photo echo, first bright rending, smoke tobacco, curling sweet, hot tar, heavy fields, new Jeep wheels, each ember that last September, we were always just about to graduate. Crickets singing summer down barefoot on the dirt road. I told you truth was very deep on library shelves. Rubbed call numbers off red spines like talismans. Red fortunes in everyone's full cup. They all sounded the same. Life and more life. The woman who brings the water. Guitars draped in mandalas. Quartz fluttering from cellophane pages all unglued. So let this be forever. Let me meet you barefoot at the crossing of the road. There will be low tables for kneeling, sage in the cup. Let rain cool the hot slates, fill round fountains. Let me pass like a photograph, hand over hand. So speaking of sacred places, because wow, I really do need to wrap it up. Uh, my husband and I took a 10 year anniversary trip a few years after our 10th wedding anniversary to England. And it's completely cliche to be like, I went to Glastonbury and had a mythic experience, but I went to Glastonbury and had a mythic experience. Kind of happens that way sometimes. 
you're like, no, it can't be. And then you get there and you're like, it is, it really is. Um, I think it's because we went at a completely random time and we went, we climbed St. Michael's toward the back way um, and there was no music festival. You know, we sort of snuck in under the radar in September, um, which is how we like to do things anyway. And that um, became a poem for me. Glastonbury, autumn. If you climb, the path waits for you. Faded shell, the blue dab stone, roll your jeans to the ankle, turn to the crescent moon. Ripe apples are falling into your hands and the blackberries, oh, this once, lose nettle and sting. All you can stomach is sweetness. If you climb, the air waits for you. Diamond bright and burning as if you jumped from fire into the fire of the setting sun, unafraid of all the quilted world rolling out beneath your feet, hair freed behind you, the girl in the photograph, head back and laughing, the girl in the photograph finally looks like you. If you climb, water waits for you, candle drenched and seeping from the rock and the garden will be closed or the garden will be open. Black dog nosing fingers one by one, all choices unmade so that love is easy again. Freshly washed like a window, your whole life passes through. If you go, you will find it. Hidden ocean, moon, a bright compass, and everywhere beating in your veins, cloud golden, gentle cows, bright apples enchanted, everything destiny, every place the place you were meant to be. And if I've timed this right, I'm going to close right on time with the final poem from the book. Um, a mast year, as you probably know by now, is a very interesting natural phenomenon, in case you have forgotten this weirdness that has inspired my whole life. A mast year is when all of the oak trees in a region will suddenly just communicate with each other, we don't know how, and decide now is the time to overproduce. And instead of a normal year of acorns, it's acorns times like three or times five. It's exponentially greater than normal. And so what ends up happening is that everything just kind of goes wild. It's overabundant. It's excessive. Um, all of the acorns lead to all of the squirrels, which lead to all of the predators. And it's like everything just sort of decides. Let's do it. Let's bloom. Um, and for me, my last year is because of Agnes Bouchelle, Jim Bouchelle, and the team at Literal Books and Balancing Act Two and the whole world and every door that opened for me because of it. And it seemed like no better image than to give shape to my book because it's truly what happened. Like one remarkable thing and then everything happened because of it. And of course I wrote a poem about it because that's what happens when you're a poet. <laughs> Called Mast Year and it's how I'd like to end tonight. Mast Year. Acorns, we hold one thing inside another. Selves we have put to rest. Treasures we gather, antler, feather, black mica, sacred stone. Now the world wakes. Sail-tailed circles, sail-tailed squirrels arc circles in the median, an orgy of population, acorn explosion, everywhere fruiting. You plant them in the sandbox, under the swing, seed all deserts, grove. So bodies pile up their fatness and their hoard. So the sun dips below the oak tree, the one that bends over my garden. I track its shadow, trying to absolve it from blame. But we are all guilty, it seems, of taking advantage of abundance. The warm spring calls the flower. The flower brings the fruit. The fruit falls, a carpet of sweetness, on the pine needles, on the dust dirt road, and we all scurry to taste. Wise crow waiting, rats flooding the yellow field, even our unlucky bodies belly full, even our oldest trees shake forth life, root whispering, feathery hand on feathery hand. Now is our time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. I hope that you, I'm so glad that everyone's video is on because there's lots of hand, 
hand clapping, but also the chat is just fabulous to look and see everyone's in real time comments. It's a democracy that I really do appreciate about Zoom. So thank you, Kate, for sharing your magnificent poetry. And thanks to all of you for engaging um, and sharing such fabulous comments. So are we moving into our interactive portion? Yeah. 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 Okay. This is a fabulous idea that I only learned of yesterday and I'm so excited. Um, oh, great. Okay. So there were some instructions dropped into the chat. Kate, do you want to talk to us a little bit about oh, yeah. the last year Cento Cento can no. <laughs> So the deal with the Cento is as follows. I'll be Italian tonight instead okay. of my normal, like, unable to speak anything self. <laughs> um, the deal with the Cento is as follows. The form means patchwork. And so we're going to build a poem together with a patchwork of our own words. The trick here is don't overthink it. So you can use a poem that you wrote. You can use a poem that you love. You can use something that you, you know, just suddenly decided to put in here. Um, we're taking such a minute piece, you don't really have to attribute. You can attribute if you want to. And here's how we're going to play. Um, I'm going to give the first line. Marika, it's going to turn to you. And then the next, and we're going to put both of ours in the chat. And then the next person can enter in. And you have two choices. If you are like, please do not make me speak on a Zoom tonight, you may just write, read me in front of your entry. And Marika and I will switch off reading. But please don't, if you possibly can help it. If you can, read your own line and you do it as follows. So we're going to give you a two line head start. When you're the next line, you turn on your mic, you turn on your Zoom, and when it's your turn, you read. So you would turn on your microphone and your Zoom two lines before you go. And you get your place in line by putting your line into the chat. So we're just going to go right down as it appears in the chat. So just so you are all aware, both we are recording this Zoom this evening for, for the archive for posterity. So please be aware that there is a recording of this happening. And also we will be um, keeping track of the, we're asking you to type in your poetry, poem, poetry line, because we want to create a, um, a record, a written record of this. So there will be a mass year, literally alive, um, Cento poem um, in the world. So those are just two things to be aware of before we dive in. All right. Which one? Where? You... Let's take, let's, let's, let's go for it. Okay, wait, 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 what am I writing? Well, you shouldn't go right after Steph. So let one person go before you. <laughs> oh, I see. There's something behind the scenes there. Okay, great. I'm gonna. I haven't actually sent mine, so I'm gonna do that. But so then, so we're let's. This is great. It's growing. So growing. Should we start? all right. Should we start reading now? Are you ready to go? Right, yeah. Go. Although mine's all the way down, so I think Stephanie actually gets to go yeah, second. Okay, but Stephanie's bold. I trust yeah, her. I love that. When do I go? Okay, <laughs> oh, no. go right after me. Get ready. Gosh, I love oh, it. Okay. All right. Cento, okay. ready? Cento, ready. ready? Here we go. One, two, a minute. Three. And we're off. It is the turning away and the not being able to turn. But now I smolder at the bottom of the sea. We choose one way or another, or we are chosen. Sunken dawn disappear into nest. Then there is only sky tying the universe together. Compassion is its own success. But the landscape is lying on its side, so you. Last night as I was sleeping, I dreamt marvelous error that I had a beehive here inside my heart. I guess that's why it's important. And 
You're live, Lucia. You're live. Oh, I, I had a line that, that didn't go through, I guess. That's okay. And what will now rescue us? That's or it. who will we become? Right. Thank you. They were delicious. You wrote <clears throat> Mer curled, I think. I think first. They are good, they are bad, they are weak, they are strong, wise, foolish, so am I. Uh-oh, Agnes, you're muted. Do it one more time, Agnes. It's okay, the poem will wait for you. Okay, hang on, we'll get you out. Hold on. Literal, can you unmute Magnus, Agnes, please? <laughs> One more time. <laughs> All right, Marika, you wanna do it together? Yeah, let's do it together. One, two, three, <laughs> archangels. Oh. Paradise. <laughs> Being in paradise. Woo! <laughs> Lie down on your side. See your assumptions. I toast to my home truth with this glass. Sinking and floating, the both and. Rolling from your pockets, pausettes omits the acres, last the. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Abundance, overkill, overflowing, tumbling full out, and shaking chaotically. Is that Marsha? Now you finally earn your wings. And so I stand on the banks yet again, waiting to be embraced by the sea. The sun is warm, but stone is cold. Now is your time. Yay. Oh, Kate, will you put your last line into the chat so we can capture it in the chat? Oh, thank you all so much. That was so fabulous. Technical issues and all. I think that's what makes this so human and also technical in a weird way. But thank you. Your way. It was so much fun. Thank you. So being cognizant that we have four more minutes in our um, in our time here together, we, well, our official time here together, um, we will have a sort of, for those of you who joined us a little bit late, we're gonna have a sort of informal wine and cheese gathering, bring your own wine, beverage, cheese, we'll be hanging out. Um, let's open it up for some questions. So if any of you have questions or comments you'd like to share with Kate, either pop those in the chat and I can read them or you feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Does that work for you, Kate? Totally. Awesome. Great. You can ask me what kind of tree I'd be, but the answer is clearly an oak tree from last year, so. <laughs> well, I would just like to thank you, Kate. This was really wonderful evening. And we wanted to have a real launch with a real party and people together. <laughs> real life but we got we got interrupted by fate and the virus and uh so we couldn't and i i'm sorry but this is just wonderful and thank you all for coming and 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 celebrating this wonderful book it is a wonderful book so thank you thank you we have some thank you agnes um, I can't wait until we can all get together and, and party and celebrate poetry in person and writing. I'm, I'm wholly looking forward to that. There is a question here in the chat about how long you have been writing poetry. 
Oh my goodness. Uh, wow. So one of my first vivid memories that I talked to Marika about was getting a beautiful pad of stationery in a drugstore back when that was what you did and like saving up my money, you know, either like Hanukkah gelt or Christmas money and like indulging, splurging on this beautiful, it wasn't, but believe me, when you were eight, it was beautiful, like overly floral drugstore mass market stationery. And thinking to myself as I took this home, what is the most beautiful thing I can put on this overly <laughs> floral mass market drugstore stationery and I was like poems I will write poems and so I wrote poems that was that were sort of like you know violets are blue and <laughs> I love you and read them to my mom on this drugstore mass market stationery so from like my earliest memories I was teaching my stuffed animals in the basement and writing poems on drugstore stationery like that was sort of a way into being and then for me, the door, uh, Dana's like, I feel I had that stationery. <laughs> 80s. Um, for me, I feel like the door really opened at Duke. And, you know, I think there's a really important thread to acknowledge in that the door opened for me for a women's writing in poetry course. It was an overtly um, risky move by my professor at the time. You know, second wave feminism, guys, it was like a folks. It was like a crazy thing to sort of say, let's pocket out a group and see what we do when we make our own space. And it was absolutely transformative for me as a writer. Like I had, I, I gained access to poetry in a way that I hadn't before. And when that left my life, I was honestly desolate. I actually, um, kind of walked around with a pretty thinly disguised poetry wound for a really long time when that left. And, you know, part of the magic of this has been seeing some of the faces from that time back here, like right now, and mm -hmm. also, you know, new communities of amazing poets of all orientation, spectra, voice, what have you, but just being in community with other writers and other creative humans has been just the most amazing gift. So for me, from the beginning, but really also kind of just now. Oh, fabulous. I, let's take one more question and I'm getting cued from, from our producer, Robert. Gretchen, did you have a question? And feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Yes, I did. So Kate, something I really love about your poetry um, is how strong your verb use is. And like the way you really creatively just use these strong verbs. So can you like talk about, I guess, um, how you see action and, and how that is reflected then in those, in those verbs that you choose and like action versus stillness, I suppose, not inaction, but stillness. Oh, Gretchen. Well, first of all, if you have not read Gretchen Rockwell, you should be reading Gretchen Rockwell who is a poet of tremendous power. And I had monster poems for you, Gretchen, and I didn't get to read them. <laughs> Later, I will send you all the monster poems. Um, I had a Star Wars poem for you and I didn't get to read it. Ah, oh, breaks my heart. Okay, we'll do it again. Different place, different time. What is that, you know, where does a verb come to me and why a particular verb and not another? You know, for me, a lot of it is I really view a lot of what I do in poetics as compensation for the fact that I'm completely tone deaf and not musical. So for me, I like rigorously work a line until it has the kind of fluidity and it has the kind of music where I feel like it moves. So, I mean, there is like a very active intention, right? Even before I get down to like which particular verb am I going to pick? It's like already I want a certain kind of movement and um, journey to happen over the course of the poem. And so I'm really conscious of, you know, which verb form do I choose? Is it gonna be a long lingering ing? Is it gonna be an infinitive? Am I gonna split it? Am I gonna hang it? Am I gonna choose a kind of off form because the sound is tighter or stricter or softer or gentler? Am I going to go for paradox and have like a slower moving verb and a faster moving line? You know, some of that is like super intentional, 
but I don't want to pretend that it all is. Sometimes it's like, this is the way it comes out. And then I look at it and I'm like, oh, that's right. That's the tension or that's the sense that I want to have. Did I give you an answer? Did I get there? Okay. That was both such a beautiful question and such a fabulous answer. It's just, oh, mm. I want to be conscious of everyone's time. So I'm going to wrap up the formal um, portion of this evening's program. But again, if you're able to, please stick on and unmute and we will chat. But first of all, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. It's so clear that we could all spend so much time luxuriating and uh, just basking in Kate's incredibly thoughtfully chosen words and her beautifully evocative poetry. So if you don't have a copy of Mass here yet, it's not only a gorgeous, I mean, the poetry is gorgeous. We've heard that this evening, but the book itself is absolutely gorgeous. Um, Kate mentioned both um, the artwork, but also the book design, you know, as, as her poem Offset said, you know, this idea of, right, like the materiality of the book. And it's just, it's a fabulous book. So I encourage you to pick up a copy if you don't. Um, uh, I have been spending a lot of time with it as I have been home. So, so thanks to all of you for being here. And Kate, thank you so much for your time and your words and sharing uh, this evening with us. I um, also want to shout out behind the scenes, behind the literal books logo is Robert Diamanti, who has just done a fabulous, always does a fabulous job um, as our producer and uh, wrangling me and uh, <laughs> reminding me to say things. So thank you, Robert. And of course, thanks to Jim and Agnes Bouchelle for uh, being a so it's an incredible force at Literal Books and just continuing to produce and um, just make such beautiful books, um, which I know is a team effort, but thanks so much for your vision. Um, so again, this is Literally Alive, where it's a series um, where we're celebrating the, the beautiful books and authors of Literal Books. Please uh, go to literalbooks.com and sign up for the um, the mailing list to learn about forthcoming programs. Um, I don't have dates for you right now, but I know that there is a forthcoming program um, with, uh, with Lori who does the book design, which is gorgeous. I'm so excited for that because I, as I've expressed about the Offset poem Kate wrote, I uh, love me some book culture. So I'm excited for that program um, as well as an evening dedicated to the latest literal books publication, Kate Kennedy's memoir, Skin, which is another gorgeous book. Um, so, so please sign up um, and uh, stay tuned uh, for those forthcoming programs. So if you need to, to jet, please um, feel free to do that. And if, if you can stick around, uh, there's more time to chat with Kate and to chat amongst ourselves and to hang out. So thanks to all of you. It's been such a pleasure to share this digital space with you. So thank you. This is cool. Now we can hey. hang out. I've been on a virtual happy hour since five, so why not <laughs> stick around? For another We're going. <laughs> <laughs> I brought everything except the wine, people. Like. <laughs> Stephanie, I have to admit, I just am so, I'm just like, look at that palm tree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look at that palm tree. Oh, my God. Okay. Hey. Hi, Robbie. Hi. Hey. Amazing. That was great. And we're going to eat dinner. <laughs> it's going to be actual great. Wine cheese. And actual cheese. And, uh. We need a cousin's. Uh... Yes, we do. Sue's on too. I know. Sue's She's walking. <laughs> I just saw her. She's walking. She's in transit. And we have, yeah, mom's on. Hey. Hi. Zoom. Zoom is wild, guys. Talk soon. Love. Love. Bye. Bye, Robbie. Bye, John. Katie, you were amazing. That was amazing. No, I'm sorry it had to be virtual. It went so fast. I'm sorry it had to be virtual, but also not because it meant I got to be here. So. I know. It's great. Gretchen, where are you joining from? I'm in Pennsylvania right now. I'm in Pennsylvania.
Pennsylvania. I am. I am. So I was like, oh, you know, I'm not in Rhode Island anymore. I won't be able to make it to Kate's thing. Surprise. Yes, I was. Yes, you can. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so. And congrats. I'm so, glad, I'm so glad you did a Zoom launch. I'm so glad you did something because this is so exciting. I know. I know. I just wish, like, I wish there could be, like, hugging and, like, congratulations. But, like, I don't know if you're familiar with Gretchen's work, but Gretchen has launched two chat books in the past okay. month. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. I'm so excited about. They're very exciting. I'm not going to lie. It's super I'm excited. excited. I'm I, very excited. But I'm very excited. I'm so excited to sit down and read this. Isn't that wild? I can't wait. I Is know. It a it's, a <laughs> it's a book. It's here. It's so beautiful. Isn't that crazy? I, I love the I love the translucent pages. They're so cool. Yeah, They're I so love cool. I entered into fisticuffs to like talk What's to our book designer. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. She's a genius. Like my favorite hate. part of this book is like you can go through and find all the hidden acorns in the book. It's like a um a Jan oh no. Who's the ch who's the children's book author? Jan Owen? Brett. Jan Brett. Brett. Thank you. It's like a Jan Brett book. Jan Brett book. You can find the and the acorns are magical. So when we chose um Judy's art, the oak leaves that she drew came from Kea. So they're a brand, a breed of Greek oak. They're like ancient Greek oak trees, and they have a different acorn. The acorn is fringed. The acorn cap is fringed. So I made my one like pushy author request. I was like, do you think we could use the Kea acorn instead of like the main acorn? And Lori was so gracious. She was like, yes, we can use the Kea acorn. And I was like, great. That was like the one thing I wanted. I was like, you know, if we had chosen these kind of magical Greek oak leaves. I wanted the acorn to like, I don't know. I wanted it, to know that they were from the same tree. It was a Poets Laureate wreath at the top. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's cool. I need to, I'm going to excuse myself, but Kate, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. It was again, such an honor and congratulations. So thank you. And lovely to see all your yeah, my my big regret is we didn't get to hang out and talk some more. I feel like it just went so fast. I know. I know. It's fast. But I also feel like people people came to hear your poetry and you and I, I mean, man, we should just schedule another one of these where we just rip. We really should. Well, <laughs> I mean, you all know Kate. You all know Kate, but like, I was just like, it was just like, boom. But I mean, this was like our first official meeting and we're sitting and it was just like, oh my gosh. I, I had planned for maybe an hour or two and it was like, five hours of conversation. That was <laughs> amazing. It was so great. <laughs> well, I came, I came back to Agnes afterward and I was like, you know, thanks for changing my life and making all my dreams come true and, you know, publishing my book. And I said, and by the way, thanks for Marika, who's the added bonus, you know, I'm like kindred spirit in the interview. I was terrified about that. I'm like, what am I going to say? And then I realized I didn't really have to say anything. We just had to sit and hang out. And like, there was a tape recorder going. Oh, to Agnes, we gave her like all five hours of the tape that she transcribes. She was like, how do I transcribe this? <laughs> what an amazing job, so. <laughs> like, I'm a library nerd, too. Like, I have, like, long-standing library, like, yeah. like, love of libraries is, you know, amazing. That could, be our, that could be our, we could just do a whole, like, ongoing podcast about that. <laughs> you know, we could always take one into Bowden. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Who says we couldn't set up a laptop in Bowden? That's hey, Bowden. 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 My it's word. Such a, uh, that's such a, um, yeah. I Man, have my Kate, I'm handing it over to you. Good. That's why the video is off. So you can't hear me mispronounce Bowden. Bowden. <laughs> Bowden, Bowden. Bowden, Bowden. Right, well, I'm going to sneak off. Have a fabulous evening, everyone. And thanks Bye. so much. Thank you. Emily, you have a very cute child. <laughs> Thanks. There's a million of them in here. That's why I've been on mute the whole time. <laughs> These are our best friends, Team Kiniston. So, thank you, Team hey! Kiniston. Hey, Sophia. Hey, Sophia. Hey. Um,
we've been we've all been listening um but some of us are more wiggly than others so some of us are <laughs> listening on camera but we wanted to shake we heard um the poem about making maple syrup and we want to let you know what we're having for dinner tonight <laughs> your maple syrup <laughs> is it good it's awesome. Did it work? it's delicious awesome <laughs> i had one for you emily i actually had one for ben that i didn't get to read um, we will have to, so I feel that this needs to continue and, um, and we need to continue having our, um, our shared poetry. Beautiful. I love what you read too. These, they came, the kids, um, 